Th thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. I am honored to be asked to come here to the Oxford Debating Society and spend a few moments with you this evening in these very important political times and uh, such tremendous tension, not only in our country, but in the world politically, which is a, an awesome time to study and parallel it to what has happened in the past throughout the world. We've had our challenges. Uh, the last few days I've been in London and you have monuments in your city of London that are statues and tributes to those who thought that there was something bigger in life than themselves and were willing to sacrifice for the greater the good, not only for their country, but for the world. What is our sacrifice going to be? Is it going to be jumping into a spitfire to save London because there's a, an emerging force? Is our sacrifice going to be one of medical? Is our sacrifice going to be one of financial? The sacrifices for our generation, meaning your generation, and I believe in your demographic, will be much different from the ones that saved this country and the world from an extremist back in the 1940s. But the reminders are so terribly important that they are there today. We have an American, I'll speak about American politics tonight, developed a sense of, I know more than you do. We have developed a sense of selfishness. And so there is no mistake in who's speaking here tonight. I want you to know that I am an unabashed liberal who used to be somewhat of an independent conservative. But things change. And our sensibilities are touched with the times that we live in that bring us to a conclusion that the world is much bigger than who we are. And selfishness is certainly no direction for salvation for any country or people. We have political divide in America right now, and we're having fights over who should keep the money, who should be given the opportunity, all the way from medical to education to public infrastructure to defense, to international intervention, to even how we're going to negotiate with those who have the power to possibly destroy us. We don't negotiate with terrorists. Terrorists of yesteryear or terrorists of tomorrow. So th this, as technology moves us forward as a society, we have a constant barrage of new challenges. One of the most important speeches in American history and I think for the world, was on the Senate floor in February of 2003, given by a senator who had seen it all, who also had changed, who had been in his life a member of, quote, the Confederacy, who in his life had been an associate of the Ku Klux Klan. But true to a statesman and evolving in the American spirit, he stood up on the Senate floor on this February day, as we contemplate the outcome of war, this chamber is silent, ominously and dreadfully silent. There's no debate. Only on the editorial pages of some of our newspapers are they questioning what our motives are? Do we know what the result of all of this is going to be? Senator Robert Byrd was the lone voice of just, along with 20 other senators who voted against the war in Iraq, who knew that it was false intelligence, who knew that this was going to, in his words, change the world, and it did. And now we're living with it. We're living with a financial burden. We ran into two wars, not paid for, because we were afraid to ask the most privileged in our country to sacrifice. Sacrifice to them was running into that P-40 and flying over and protecting a city. The thought of sacrifice that maybe the privileged should address income inequality in America, that never came to mind. We ask the poorest of the poor to sign up for military service and go serve 
under the promise that we are definitely going to meet our obligations when it comes to veterans' benefits, and it doesn't happen. I offer to you tonight that I think that the United States of America has some very serious moral and ethical questions that we must answer. The fact that we don't realize because of our selfishness that we could bring the entire world financial system to the verge of collapse because we have decided we don't want to pay our bills. What we have committed to as a legislative body and the president cannot spend a dime. What the legislative body has decided to commit to all of a sudden because of not being able to get their political way has even entered into the discussion that we would burden your country or others who have thought America was a good investment. And we've had the discussion, well, maybe we won't pay this bill because number one, we don't like the president. We are denying the last election. We do not believe in his agenda for healthcare in America. And so we will obstruct him and stop him at all cost. The questions always asked, is President Obama a good negotiator? He has been an olive branch to the opposition since the day he's come into the White House. His DNA has been one of a community organizer to bring people together. If the man walked into this room tonight, he would be disappointed if he didn't impress all of you. That's in his DNA, it's not confrontation. The President of the United States finally drew a line in the sand and said, you're not going to take health care away from 40 million Americans. This gentleman is young. I'm going to use him as an example tonight. <laughs> he has cancer. He has no health insurance. The insurance company in America told him that we can't do business with you. You're too much of a risk. We have a political party in this country after an election and a re-election and a decision by the Supreme Court 42 times voted to deny this man coverage in America. We were willing to give the power back to the corporations and to the insurance industry. Forget who's paying for it. That's minor. It's the moral sensibility of who we are as a people that is being threatened in our country right now. It is the epitome of selfishness to turn to a young man and say, you may be an American and you may have paid your taxes and you may have your heart and your dreams and your future ahead, but you can't have health care because the corporation said that you're sick. We're going to deny you. Does that sound like America? Does that sound like the model of the world? Does that sound like a position that should be revered by other countries? That's a travesty. Now, we can talk about, okay, well, who's gonna pay for universal health care? That's minor. It's who we are, what is our heart and what is our soul as a country is what the next generation is going to have to answer. Are we going to be a country of the privileged? Are we going to be a country that's morally bankrupt? Are we going to be a country that doesn't care about our next door neighbor? Because all of the things that made America great, equal rights, civil rights, workers' rights, women's rights, all of the great things that made America great are now under attack by the conservative movement in our country. Why? because they want to concentrate the wealth, they want the political power, they will go so far to deny elections, and they will fix the Supreme Court to make sure that they can bankroll as much as they possibly want into any election. I offer to you tonight that we may have gone into that war not willing to pay for it, but George W. Bush was one of the greatest conservative presidents in the history of the United States. One of the greatest. He gave tax cuts to the wealthiest Americans. He blew up the federal budget deficit to the point where we had to have this discussion 10 years after the war. Gosh, I don't know, do we pay for roads? Do we pay for public education? Do we start picking and choosing uh, neighborhoods of who's gonna make it and who's not? 
and he put two extremists on the Supreme Court. One thing about American politics, whereas the liberals have not done a very good job, the conservatives have done a great job of, like a business, what's your one-year plan? What's your five-year plan? What's your 20-year plan? What's your generational plan? The generational plan for the conservatives has been to get the Supreme Court. Get our ideologues on the Supreme Court. Do whatever you can to get the White House, the House, and the Senate. And the Republicans have always been about power. They understand power. The conservative movement understands power. You can't find a poll in America that says Social Security should be privatized. But that's their goal. You can't find a poll in America that says an American should be denied health insurance. But that's what the conservatives want to do. It has gotten so corrupt that the old saying, all politics is local, radical governors who have helped take over state houses and state legislative bodies have now passed laws in the state of Michigan that if they don't like the way the city's being run and if the financial bottom line doesn't work out to their liking, they're going to circumvent local elections and they're going to appoint a financial emergency manager to run the city the way the governor thinks it should be run. This is scary stuff. When you have in front of the Supreme Court last year, here last week, hearing arguments that there should be no limits to individual capabilities to give to campaigns. We have Citizens United unlimited funds from corporations, but now, hell, if you're George Soros's kid and you'd like to see a liberal get elected in the South, you could probably bankroll it pretty good. Circumventing your vote, your voice, and all the activism that your community may be involved in. That is the new America. That's not the America that I grew up in. It was six kids and 11 grandkids. It'd be easy to just throw me in the ground when I tip over, but when the kids do that, I want them to say the old man stood up and said something when things were wrong. And this is wrong. And this is our sacrifice. I can't go jump in a fighter plane to protect New York City, but I can stand up and speak the truth about where we're making our mistakes as a democracy. Democracy brings us what? Freedom. What kind of freedom? What if a group of people elect an extremist? Is that democracy? Do we want democracy? No, it has to start with a moral sensibility of who we are as a people and do we believe in America being a great country and being the leader of the world? And I believe that the Tea Party is the underpinning and the true rotten foundation to change all of that. They are the selfish ones. We have in this country right now, in America, labor under attack. And I know that you have labor issues, not only here in Great Britain, but actually all around the world. President Obama, who I believe in, is now on the verge of fast-tracking a trade agreement, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which I believe will undermine just about every wage earner in the country. NAFTA didn't work, GATT very questionable, but now the TPP will think it's okay for someone in Vietnam to work for 25 cents an hour. These trade agreements across the world have brought our standard of living down instead of raising the other countries up because of the corporate greed and the attack on labor. We've seen it in state houses across America where they've tried to make it illegal for collective bargaining to take your voices away in the workplace, to drive down policy on workers where they have no voice and if they do, they are threatened with termination. Is that freedom and democracy? Does that sound like a great country? No, that's oppression is what that is. What built America was labor. And the fruits of labor across our globe must be realized if we are going to be a stable society. 
We have to make sure that fairness is part of the equation. That doesn't mean you can't go out and make millions of dollars. That doesn't mean that you can't be in a system and reach your potential because not everybody's gonna have the same abilities. But to pick and choose when it comes to opportunity and equality based on someone's ability is wrong. We are now picking and choosing neighborhoods in America as to who gets funded and who doesn't in public education. And a lot of it has to do with the color of their skin. That's wrong. You know the great thing about public education? When the doors open, everybody's welcome. The rich, the poor, the gifted, the challenged. What happened to that? Why has America decided to go after teachers? Why have we decided to degrade the voices in the workplace and suppress them? Why have we decided to pick low-income neighborhoods in America not to get the resources that some of the wealthier neighborhoods get? Why? Because we have run amok in our political system. Special interests runs America. Independent voices and activism is seriously being challenged. But when you have extremists on the Supreme Court and you have a concentration of wealth and a 30-year attack on labor and you have income inequality, and if you think that this doesn't reach down to your own backyard, think again in America. I come from the middle of the country, Minnesota, the land of 10,000 lakes. The state where we had a bridge fall down in 2007 and killed 13 people and nobody wanted to do anything about it. To this day, half the bridges in America are deemed structurally insufficient. But we can't get our politicians to come together on an infrastructure package that would fix all of that. Such an admirable quality, isn't it? All for what? Political gain. <coughs> Sacrifice. We've attacked the infrastructure of education. We've attacked the infrastructure of the basic services of America to the point where it's going to be much harder for someone who is born into the middle class, economically challenged, and socioeconomically positioned, it's gonna be harder and harder for them to reach their potential. This is what I have at odds with the conservative movement. They're not fair. They're about them and the fact that they would take our country to the brink of not paying the bills because of a health care law is despicable. It is a low moment for America. And I respect President Obama for standing as strong as he did when he did to give, to give the progressive movement the backbone that it needs to challenge these radicals and these zealots who think they should be the privileged ones. In the midst of all of that, we have, to, we have to realize that in America, there will be a ripple effect. Britain, France, Spain, Germany, Asia, there'll be a ripple effect. And we could easily, I believe, have gone into a worldwide depression. And it is up to us as a country to recognize our responsibilities that selfishness is not the answer. Never has been and it never will be. And so the next time you walk by these monuments in London and you read about the 6,300 B-17s that flew out of Duxford and didn't come home, that was their sacrifice. Are we willing as Americans to make our sacrifice, which is going to be financial, which is going to be financial, which is going to mean that until we get our finances in order, the wealthiest Americans are gonna to have to step up and write the check. I have on the Ed Show what we call the vulture chart. Over the last 30 years, you can see the income inequality that has taken place in America. And the blue line is the middle class and the wage earners who have hardly gained at all in the last 30 years. But because of the corporate interests and because of the concentration of wealth, we have seen the top 2% fall. 
thrive to over 350% of income gain. The concentration of wealth, I believe, in America is race-based. This is why President Obama is obstructed to the ultimate. No president has had to put up with a record number of filibusters as this president. No president has been so centrally despised by those who politically oppose them to the point they would call him a communist, a socialist, a Marxist. No president deserves that. But this is the discourse in our country. And the challenge for the progressive movement is to stand up and speak and tell the truth and don't back down and believe in what made our country great. Because we will have a ripple effect. We will change the world if we don't answer the critical questions that are in front of us now. Could I do this at six o'clock on MSNBC in New York City every night? No, but in bits and pieces I can. In bits and pieces I can go to the airwaves every night and talk about someone who's been deprived. I can talk about that teacher who is not going to be able to negotiate a good salary. We're going to be able to talk about the medical system in bits and pieces as time goes on as to how we can move our country forward to have better outcomes, to reduce our costs. But the moral component of it all is really what it's about. And so that's what I try to do on my show. And that's where I think the, the discussion is in America. And we live in dangerous times when it comes to communication. The corporate media is very strong in America. Dissenting voices are hard to find. The concentration of wealth is very real. And so we just have to keep fighting. This is our fight now. This is our fight.